it, it was like we'd broken up and uh, it was like four or five years and I, we went like we never used to we just avoid each other it was a really bad split it was course, really yeah. really heavy yeah hey folks I hope everybody is staying healthy and sane while they're indoors at the moment and um, on this week's episode uh, we have Billy McGuinness from Aslan uh, Aslan are arguably uh, one of the biggest bands in Ireland maybe next to you two they are the biggest band uh, and they have an amazing story and background uh, and me and Billy uh, had a great chat about that about their breakup and some of the drama with that so uh, yeah I hope you enjoy uh, the podcast uh, please like us on Facebook and Instagram and um, yeah talk to you soon Um, and actually it was during that is when I did the video for you guys, the crazy world thing. Wow. Uh, and I was actually dying sick. I can't figure out how to do this. We're just going to run like this. I was dying sick, Billy. And uh, Denise had sent me a message and I thought, man, this is just such a great idea. So I, I got it. Was an great. The video was great. It was really, really good. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate Very that. Good. I, I, Very good. Drug myself out of, out of my, uh, my bed, came into my office because I wasn't, I had to be quarantined for my kids and my wife. Mm. I had to stay in the room for two weeks, but my office is mine. Nobody else goes into it. So I okay. came next door, did it for a couple of hours, and then it did another yeah. couple of hours the next day. But it was it's, cool, though. Yeah, it worked out it's really just, good. That song, like, uh, you know, whenever, like, you know, when 9 11 happens, uh, that song becomes relevant whenever there's, there's shit things going on in the world. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of timeless, that song. Yeah. When you think about it, it's 25, what is it about it, it's 25 years. I, I don't know. If I knew we'd bottle it, Dave, and we'd, <laughs> use, it, we'd use that formula in every song. I, I think Christy touched off it. When a song touches, touches you in some way and resonates with you, that's when, that's when, it, that when it makes sense, you know? But we're yeah. crazy world. It's just, it's on so many different levels, you know? Yeah. Like the song was written about Christy trying to protect Kira in this crazy world when she was born. How can I protect you in this crazy world? That's where your idea came from. But it, it's just taken its own legs now, and it's it's relevant. It's as relevant today as when it was when, when it was written, you know. And it's 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 twenty five years old. It's, yeah. it's it's frightening, you know. And it, it's so you're you're so right because I've heard it so many million times now, and I actually have Aslan uh, made in Dublin on vinyl. I had Christy sign it for me actually when I seen him, and I listen to it constantly. It's so brilliant, and. You know, as any song that you've listened to over a couple of decades, you sort of whatever. And then when I was doing the video again, it was like I rediscovered it again. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I was yeah, hearing it yeah. with new ears. And I guess it is because what you were saying, what's going on in the world, it was really resonating with me. Yeah, you know what it, I mean? It, it, so. it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, This Is is a better song, in my opinion. It, it's a far better song, you know, it lyrically lyrically and structurally. And, you know, it, yeah. I, just, I just think it's a... It's, it's a it's it's an amazing song, uh, but Crazy World touches people the way yeah. this is doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, you know? But this is, I suppose, was of its time, and because it's an amazing song, but because the recording was done at a certain period of time, it has yeah. a certain sonic thing. I wonder if this is if you wrote this is now and brought it out. Yeah, I wonder how that was. Do you know what I mean? With it, I, get, being I, get, I get what you're saying. That 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 song was recorded in 1987 in Westland Studios on the old reel to reel analog. Two inch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mick Glossop produced it, and the reason we got Mick Glossop was because we were listening to a band called the Water Boys at the time. Uh, you know the Hall of the Moon. Oh yeah, Mick. that al- that album. Yeah. So Mick Mick Lusser produced that album. So that was the sound we kind of wanted, you know, right. for, for our debut album. But uh, I get we've we've actually thought about you know uh, re-recording this is, uh, but it's capturing. You know, we were we were a certain age. Yeah, we were bulletproof. You know, yeah. we were we were going to, con- to conquer the world. Here we are, thirty-seven years later. Mm. Would 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 this? Would we get the same vibe on this? Is I don't know. Yeah, but maybe it's something we should have to try. Do you know what I mean? Well, look, yeah, I don't. Appear, well, I was I was a musician, uh, or I am a musician, but that was what I started doing. And actually, as I was saying, I think Bud Prager managed me. Uh, for I, 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 I'm I'm familiar with Bud yeah. Prager and the story, the whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, but he managed me, and I, when I was younger, uh, 
I felt I was bulletproof, you know. And I remember about eight years ago, um, I'd come back from America and I'd no money. I was trying, I'd been living there and I, and I was trying to get a booking agent. So I went on The Voice of Ireland, of all things. But I couldn't get anybody to give me any gigs. And so anyway, I got into two shows and I mean, I'm mortified about it, but it is what it is now, you know. And there was a guy on there named Ray Scully and he's a young guy. I don't know if you know who he is. I know Ray Scully. I know. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen him on The Voice. I yeah. saw him on The Voice. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic singer. Yeah. And I remember going is he, down. Is he the guy that wears the cap? He used to wear, he wore a cap on The Voice, I think. I can't remember if he did yeah, or not. I, 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 I know. I, yeah, I know the guy. I know. Yeah. He's actually gigging the pub circuit here. That's him, yeah. That's it, yeah, well, race I, yeah. I remember I went down to, uh, you know, they do like an acoustic night in Brussels. Yes. And I went down and I played, and actually people who used to come see the band years ago when we used to play Temple Bar Music and Name of Dorans came down. And then I played, and then Ray Scully got up. And Ray Scully, I'm 44, he had that bulletproof, oh, you know, yeah. you yeah. raise the roof of the place and, and I and I and it was almost like, you know, show up to the prom like a decade late. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I but don't know about the this is thing. That's a that's a yeah. really good point because, you know, there are there is a time when you have that thing, don't yeah. you? Yeah. And I think it's sometimes it's best to just leave it at and it, it is what it you know, this is was recorded in eighty seven in Westland on two inch tape. You know, we Christy was what twenty odd. You know, everything changes over time. You know, yeah. But but either way, it's a great song. Yeah. It's, and for for a band, for a band to come out with a song like this is as the first single, it was just that's just changed. It changed everything for us. That song. Yeah, because it's not it's not a single in the sense of the way Bull Prager was trying to meet no. me to get right singles it's like shite a, songs that are lowest common down there. It's a great song. Yeah, it's not a verse chorus, verse chorus, verse chorus. It's not one of those. You know, it's no. not a you know don't bore us, get to the chorus. Yeah, it's it's a song. It's 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 a song and it tells a story. You know, mm. and it's 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 uh, it's yeah, yeah. But for yeah. for us. For us, when that was released, that just changed everything, David. You know, yeah, just, you know, and it was yeah. what it, it was so hard to get released in the first place. Really? Why is uh, that? Yeah, yeah. Well, nobody, nobody was interested in the song, and I mean nobody. We we recorded that. Uh, we did the demo of it in a place called the Lab Studios in Little Lane. Do you remember Little Lane? Yeah, of course. And did, yeah. Uh, a guy called Chris O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And that was it. Was recorded. The original was recorded on. I think it was a sixteen track. Right, and uh, we hawked it round. We sent it round to all the all the record companies, as you do. Uh, there was three tracks, you know, whatever. This is being the, the lead track on it, and just nobody was interested. Everyone rejected it, you know. Uh, so we went to this Irish company called Rikus Records, and there was a girl called Elvira Butler, and uh, she said, "Look, I I like the song." Um, I'll do a thousand copies and we'll put it out there and we'll see what happens. So when when that song was released by Rikus, uh, what happened was you had late night DJs on 2FM. You had Mark uh, Mark Cagney and Jerry Ryan. Mm. Jerry Ryan used to be on, uh, say, 10 to 12 and then Mark would be on 12 to 2. So Mark Cagney reviewed the single for the Hot Press and he gave it single of the fortnight. And then he started playing it late night on 2FM. Right. And he was just raving about the song. This was the original, the original version. I don't know if you've heard it. It's very uh-huh. raw. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, very, yeah. very raw. Yeah. And uh, it, Mark Ryan then got, got in touch with Jerry Ryan. They'd meet, obviously, in, in 2FM. And Mark was saying, you have to listen to this song, Jerry. And then Jerry Ryan started playing it. Right. And then when he started playing it on 2FM, suddenly it started to get daytime play. And then everything just just changed. It's amazing. Suddenly you had like, you know, 12, 14, 16 record companies chasing us, all looking for the next U2. Which of was course, never, yeah. Which was never gonna happen. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But it was it was it was exciting times because if you if you can remember, but I'm slightly older than you, so mm. every record company in the UK had an Irish band on their label. Mm. You know, you had like in Two and Newer were signed to Ireland. Uh, Cactus World News were signed to MCA. Something Happens were signed to Virgin. Blue and Heaven. Uh, there was, there was lot, every, every band. 
and uh, they were all looking for the next U2. Of course, there was never going to be another U2, you know? Yeah, but sure. I, I was signed in. I was signed to Sony in 1996, and our, and the guy who signed us, a guy named John Culloden, our very famous A&R guy, and his assistant, Rod Kukla, when, when they signed us, so he's looking for the next U2. Oh, 1996. So they've yeah. never gotten sick of that line. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Ahead, I yeah. No, 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 it's crap. But I mean, at those times, if you think about it, the population of Ireland back then was like 4 million. Mm. And we were really punching above our weight music was. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I can understand why, you know, you had you two, you had Tin Lizzy, Sinead O'Connor came out with that, that batch. Um, Ah, Van Morrison and and go and the list goes on and on. So it was exciting times. It was really really exciting. Of course, we ended up signing to EMI, mm. which was fantastic. And you know, we uh, that year, nineteen eighty seven, we got to support Bowie because he was signed to EMI, and we insisted on it. We could do those things in those days. We want to support the Bowie at Slane. Yeah, we're on your label, and and we got it. You know, yeah. they were just they were exciting times. Very. I remember exciting. Christy telling me about. You and him jumping onto Bowie's secret stage that you weren't yes, supposed to go on. We to. weren't supposed to do Tell that. Tell us about that. Go on. Yeah, it was great. <clears throat> Basically, it was that uh, he had a what was the tour he was on? Um, it was an indoor tour, David, that was outdoor and slain. Okay. It, it didn't really work. It didn't it, like as Bowie as Bowie gigs go. Mm. It wasn't his best gig. It wasn't his best day. I think you know. Okay. I think. Um, what was it? It wasn't the Serious Moonlight Tour. No, that was a brilliant tour. I can't think of the name of the tour. Anyway, there was a part of the stage. He had all these dancers and there was a part of the stage. There was the main stage and then you had the... It was the Glass Spider Tour. That's what it was. You had a big glass spider on right. the stage and you had a front area where all the dancers used to perform and Bowie had come up from the stage and all this smoke and mirrors and everything. And we were told, under no circumstances, I used to go near that part of the stage. But when we walked out in Slane, I mean... The nearest, the nearest person to you was like, you know, 60 meters away. Yeah. So Christy being Christy, he just straight away, four song, bang, straight down onto where he wasn't supposed to go. <laughs> what are they going to do? Pull him off? <laughs> no way. Yeah. So it was great. He's done that a few times, you know. I'm sure he has. It's a bit of a rule breaker. Old- there, was, there was a gig we were doing in uh, Mount Joy Prison. And uh, <clears throat> we were asked, would we go in and play for the prisoners? And... Uh, we said, yeah, when do you want us to do it? And he says, well, whenever you want. They're going nowhere. They're in here, <laughs> they're in yeah. here seven. They're a bit like us in lockdown at the moment, sure. you know. And we went into the hall and and the inmates were brought in and there was two rows of seats and they had the seats kind of empty, the, the stage, and then you had two rows of empty seats and the seats were facing backwards so no one could sit on them. And uh, the warden said to Christy and, and ourselves, under no circumstances are you to go near the inmates, stay on the stage. Mm. Christy, straight out, for song, <laughs> straight over the seats, in amongst the inmates, they're all going nuts. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> but that's, that's Christy, you know, that's, yeah. you know. Well, he's a rock star. It's, it's rock and roll, do you know what I mean? That's it's, exactly, yeah. I seen, I seen Aerosmith at the, at the point years ago, or the three arenas it's known now, and, and this big fella, got up on stage and ran over to Steven Tyler and security were trying to pull him out. And Steven Tyler told them no. And then Steven Tyler gave him his mic and let him sing. And he said, oh, oh, that's what rock and roll is all about. You know, no, yeah, probably made that dude's life. Like, he, uh, that's the story he'll tell for the rest of his life now. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, a friend of mine was a big Brian Adams fan. Brian Adams used to do this thing where he'd let you get up on stage and you could play guitar with him. And he did. He got up and played with him when he was here. And, he got, had a big impact on it as well. Darren Murphy is his name. If you listen to this podcast now, delighted he got mentioned. <laughs> we did uh, We did uh, one of the best gigs we ever did uh, was 1994. We supported Brian Adams in the RDS. And what happened was, it was how, how the gig was, was so good. Normally when you do a support to a, to a big band, you're going on to like a half empty stadium or whatever. You're the warm up act, you know. But for whatever reason it was, Ryan Adams was late arriving to the gig. Don't know why. So Aslam went on at his stage time. Wow. The place was around. You'd like, wherever the RDS holds, 30, 30,000, 35,000. It was not a crazy world was just there. And we went out and the stadium was rammed. But I'll never forget it. 
when when the audience started singing Crazy World back mm. and I went, wow, this is like, I have to remember this moment. This is really, really good. Of course. You know? Yeah. We were, we've been very fortunate to, to play support to a lot of, uh, you know, really brilliant acts. Yeah. We did Elton, Elton John. In, no in, way, really? Yeah, uh, Elton John, yeah, it was great in uh, Fitzgerald Stadium in, in uh, Killarney. We did Bowie and Slane, obviously. We did Joe Cocker in Brighton. Wow. Support to Joe Cocker. Um, Brian Adams, who we've mentioned, you know. Yeah. So we've been very, we've been very lucky. You know? Yeah. I think they were very lucky to have Aslan, if you ask me. Ah, <laughs> too let, me let me ask too you this, Billy. So obviously, you know, you guys broke up and that was during that period when you guys yeah. were, were broke up and you, yeah, you had another singer as Precious Stones, didn't you? We had, no, Joe, Joe took over the singer Joe's Precious okay, Stones. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And we released three singles. Um, Jesus Says He Loves Me, I Won't Let You Down and Red Sky. And basically, David, nobody wants to know they just wanted Aslan. Sure. They wanted, yeah, they wanted Christy back with the band. Yeah. And, and the, the three say, you know, the, the songs were great. You know, the, mm. the, Joe was being a major writer, you know, in Aslan and in the Precious Stones. So the, the quality of the songs was, was, was re really good, but just nobody wants to know, you know, they didn't get any radio play. We, it was like, you know, we'd had our shot and we dropped the ball. Mm. And and they weren't going to let us forget that, you know. Yeah, well, I think during that period of time, I seen Christy in the Olympia with uh, Dignan Goff. Would have yeah, been Dignan Goff. And 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 people wanted Christy back in Aslan as well. There, mm. do you know what I mean? Like that was that was those were Aslan fans there who wanted Aslan back. I mean, I I seen Christy in the bag it in. Yeah, and, I saw him at the back of the day. That's how we actually, how we actually, the ice kind of broke because so, we, we were. what I was going to ask you. So yeah. I didn't, I seen Joe. So me and Christy were in the little room above the back of the day after the gig and Joe came in. And I knew Maura, I knew Joe's ma, but I'd never met him. Right. But I knew who he was from all the, the I had the album and everything. I'm, yeah. I think you're Joe Joel. And this guy yeah. says, Joe Jewel, that's not how you say his name. And then Chris said, listen, we're going to chat. So tell me about that. So that must have been part of the... Well, the I event. wasn't there for that, Dave. This okay. was another gig where me and Tony went to the Bagged Inn. Okay. And it, it was like we'd broken up and uh, it was like four or five years. And we went, like we never used to, we just avoid each other. It was a really bad split. Of it course, was really, yeah. really heavy. Yeah. You know, and we'd avoid each other and we wouldn't talk or we didn't do anything. But myself and Tony went to the Bag It In. I think we were asked to do the Janelle Shopping Centre gig and we'd been asked every year to do this gig. It was like a charity the open gig. open air one? The open air one that we finally did. We did agree to do it five years after the split. And I think we had to, we went in to see Christy just to see how the ice would, how, how the feelings were. And we were in the Bag It In and everyone knew we were there. Like I had the mad blonde hair, you know what I mean? Just yeah, yeah. It. <laughs> There's that dog from Aslan, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> and, and myself and Tony went into the bag it and um, Christy was there and Christy copped that we were there, you know? So we were, and it was, there was a real, the audience were, now the bag it in a small, you know, yes. three or 400 people. So you're in the room, everyone knows you're in the room, you know? Yeah. But Christy went into This Is and, I'll never forget it. It was like Spinal Tap. You know, did you see the movie Spinal Tap? Of course I have. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know when he gives him the nod on stage, do you want to come up on stage? You know? yeah. So Christy gave us the nod. Really? <laughs> yeah. He says, uh, I think he said something like, Billy and Christy are in the, or Billy and Tony are in the house. Uh, just want to get up, lads. Amazing. So Tony grabbed the bass. And I just, I think I just stood there and sang back and vocals, but that was the kind of the icebreaker. That was, that was it. That was it. And that was, it was like, do we want to do the Janelle gig? Yes, of course we do. We did the Janelle gig, we did, which was the Feel No Shame album. Mm. We had only one album. We rehearsed that in a week. Bang. Uh, Christy came back from America, actually. He was over there with Dignam and Goff. Bud Prager yeah. was looking after him at the time. Yeah. And um, uh, we got up, uh, we got we did a week, week's rehearsal with Feel No Shame and we said, why don't we try write something new? And we wrote Crazy World and we played Crazy World at the Janelle gig. It was torrential rain. We played Crazy World and there was a fella called Joe Stewart 
and Freddie Middleton from Sony BMG. And Joe Stewart came back to us after the after the gig and said, "That new song he's played, uh, do you just want to release it? Like, there's a deal there if you want it. It wow. was that like unheard of. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, well, like, unheard of. But at the same time, Billy, I think you're Aslan. Do you know what I mean? I think you know you you guys are are you are that great a band. The songs are there. That whatever that happens, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the on the thing. Because Aslan are a huge part of my musical architecture, if you like. When I would wake up staying at Christie's house every morning, and we'd be listening to to uh, Feel No Shame. We listen to Feel No Shame. We listen to Peter Gabriel. Uh, so, and be like, I'll put on Pretty Thing. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, like just fucking wow. Do you know what I mean? And I guess when you guys got back together, it was just that magic is there. Yeah, and you, yeah. you can't recreate that. That's why there's bands that are successful. And then there's loads of bands. You know this yourself. Great musicians, you know, great this, that, and the other. But they just don't have that thing, whatever yeah, it is. It is. I, I agree with you entirely, you know. And I mean, for Christy and fair play to him, you know, because... Bud Prager was negotiating a deal with Epic Records with, with Christie at the time for the Dignam McGough thing. And after the week's rehearsal with us and writing this, I think we wrote Where's the Sun and we wrote Crazy World and we possibly wrote Rain Man as well. They're the three songs that were on Good Boy Charlie Moonhead. But um, in, 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 in Christie's, like, it, he just turned around straight away and went, it was all about the music. And he said, I can write songs of that caliber with Aslan, mm. and it's a much better music that I'm that I'm doing yeah. as opposed to with Dignam McGough. And he rang Bud and said, "Look, I'm not going back. Mm. I'm I'm going back with Aslan, you know, because yeah. we have some unfinished business, as he said, you know. And yeah. suddenly, you know this business, David. You don't get an, a second bite of the apple." No, especially when you drop the ball yourself. Do you know what I mean? And, I, Which we and did. I've done it, so I know uh, yeah, exactly what you're talking did. about. So yeah. we dropped the ball, and then we suddenly we had another record deal with Sony BMG, wow. and off we went again, as if the five year break was just five days. It was just that's amazing because you don't. It's very hard. I mean, we how we ended up. We had a contract extension that I refused to sign, and that got us dropped by Sony. So there was a period we had done the album. We did the album with Kevin Shirley, very famous producer. He did Aerosmith, uh, Silver Chair. He did all the remixes of uh, uh, Led Zeppelin. He's a really big, big uh, American rock yeah, producer. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was all, you know, unfinished this, that, and the other. And the guy who signed us signed Aerosmith and, you know, all these big, big bands. Like, it has to be real American single kind of thing. Yeah, and they wanted me to co-write with people, and I, you know, I was young and I was arrogant, and you know, they wanted me to write with Tommy Shaw uh, from Six, and uh, I was like, no, 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 and I refused to sign this thing, and we got dropped. Now the management company didn't drop us, but then we went out to LA, couldn't get anything, couldn't get anything. We got offered a development deal, I think, couldn't get anything, and then we ended up getting an independent deal after that. But even trying to go back around to Sony, like they weren't interested. Do you know what I mean? Like it was just, you see, so you're right. You are, I mean, but again, maybe that's because the talent went out for you. Do you know what I mean? That you had that talent and that magic to bring you and elevate you up again. I think what we had, David, was we had uh, the fact that we were a good live band and we had a following. Yes. Because if you're a brilliant band and you don't have a following, well then financially you can't keep going. Mm, that's true. So at least we had the gigs to fall back on. Even you know when we lost our deals, mm. we still had this following. Yeah, and, and that following has for the past thirty odd years, that following has never waned. You no. know, for us to be able to to do gigs like the Ivy Gardens or the Olympia of our three nights in Vicar Street, I know it sounds it, it sounds great, but we really, really expect you know respect that we have that following. Because mm. without them following us through the lean times, mm. we mightn't be here now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what, that's what happens a lot of bands. Mm. It's just they don't have that financial. Once the, once the record company goes and they're, they're back they're on their own again, mm. you, need, you need an inner strength to, to actually keep going. You know, yeah. what, are, what are we going to do next? And I, I could give you so many examples 
of how we have turned our careers around when there was when we were looking in darkness. That deal with Sony BMG, for 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 example, we went in and recorded Goodbye Charlie Moonhead with Chris O'Brien and Joe Joel uh, um, co producing produced the album. And uh, I think Joe doesn't get the recognition that he deserves production wise. He's been involved in every Aslan recording since day one. He's the he's the one he's the band member that's at the desk basically. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was always it, my impression. And, it, and it's great to have someone like that in the band. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. You know, we're we're lucky that we have that we have someone like that. But uh when when the album was finished and it was delivered to the UK, uh now, Crazy World was at the gone through the roof over here. It was mm. single of the year. It was in the the longest played single on 2FM. It was like, it was a hit. Yeah. Without a doubt. So the UK branch of Sony BMG said, there's no hits on the album. <laughs> of course they did. Of course they did, yeah. <laughs> so we're looking and we're going, hang on a minute. Are you telling us that the Irish people over there are fecking idiots, that they don't know a hit song? This song is going through the roof over here. Yeah. Just release it. Just put it out and see what happens in the UK. Please. David, they wouldn't even do that. They dropped yeah. us. They dropped see, us. Record labels, the people who work at record labels typically don't know anything about music. They don't know anything about arts. Typically, what they know about, and most of them are scared for the jobs. You know this, Billy. So what they do is they try and sign the new U2. Yeah. Or they try and sign the new thing that they think is is following on the footsteps of something else. And and there's a lot of um, a lot of people, particularly la- laterally, you know, went and got marketing degrees or different things. Or they, the entertainment officer for their college and they end up being an A&R man. And these yeah. people don't know anything about art. They don't know anything about what people want. They just, yeah. you know like what I mean? Sheep. I call them sheep. They're like sheep, you know? And an example of when, when one A&R man came over to see us, the following week we had 16 or 17 A&R men because the word filtered out. Of course. And Aslan were going to be the next big thing. But so going back to the Charlie Moonhead thing, we, we, we were suddenly left. We had, we had left it. We finished the album, delivered it to the UK, and we had a year where we were going to go over to the UK, tour mm. over there, promote the album, promote the single, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So suddenly we're dropped and we went, right, hang on a minute, what are we going to do? And this is where most bands fall down. When you're dropped, it doesn't mean you're a bad band or it just means it's one person that yeah. can't see it. It's the one A and R man that can't see it. You have to remember the, the, the reasons why you were signed in the first place. Yes. You have to believe in yourself and pick yourself up. I'll never forget this. We were, we, we'd a year left and we'd, we'd nothing. We'd mm. no gigs planned because we were the record company. We weren't going to tour the UK. And we said, what are we going to do? And at that time, MTV Unplugged was just kicking off. Mm. Do you remember the MTV Unplugged you had? Yeah, of course. Nirvana yeah. and all yeah. them and all them great sessions on yeah. that. Two acoustics, bass and drums. That's what we'll do. Mm. We'll start, we'll just scale, because we couldn't afford the truck and the gear yeah. and the crew and the mm. whole lot. So we pared everything down. We could It could all fit in a high ace van. Yeah. Right? With the yeah. band. With yeah, the yeah. band. With of the band. Course. And we're talking like 19... 1996 here, 1995, 96. Charlie Moon had come out in 84. So we pared everything down. And the great thing about the songs was the songs worked acoustically, Dave. Yeah, because they're great songs. You can pick it, you can pick it, even to this day, it's still the the way we write. It's an acoustic guitar Mm -hmm. and the five of us in a room. Um, You know, obviously, Joe would be one of the main songwriters. Sure. But everyone pays the part. It could even be, you could be looking for you could be looking for a word, a sentiment, and Alan might say it, or sure. I might say, it, or Rob might say, it. that's it, that's the one, that's the one. Because yeah. Christy has to believe in what he's singing. Of course, it, uh, he has to believe it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we paired we paired everything down, and we said we'll go and play the cabaret pubs. Mm. But the way we were looking at it was we were going. Now, we were slated for doing this, David. We were, yeah. uh, Aslan are turning into a pub band, da, da, da. But we were going, you know, you might have had your cabarets in there on a on a, a Thursday or a Friday. Saturday, Aslan would go in there 
and we were playing our original songs. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're playing to 60,000 people or you're playing to 200 people. Yeah. So we started doing that and lo and behold, everywhere was rammed, mm. was full, you know, and, and then we started taking it down to, down to Cork, Killarney, and, and, and this thing was like, wow, this is, it was Aslan Unplugged. Yeah. So then we said, we'll take it to the next level. I'm fast forward now here. And we said, we were doing five nights in Vicar Street. Right. We said, we'll bring, we'll bring a string quartet in, two acoustics, bass and drums. We'll bring a percussion player in, keyboard player, and, and say, still keep it acoustic. Mm. Still keeping the whole thing acoustic. And of course that led to Made in Dublin. Mm. Again, we were advised, don't do a live album, lads. Live albums don't sell in Ireland. Again, we follow the heart. Mm. We says, we're at the building this to where we can do five nights in Vicar Street. Let's record it. Let's do a DVD. And Made in Dublin is our biggest selling album of all our albums. Wow. Well, it's amazing. And that's because so good. <laughs> we had the belief not to listen to other people. Mm. And just, we had this idea. Now, it was just, you know, it was, it was just an, an amazing time. We took that show, David, I'll never forget, 1999, we did Aslan Unplugged in the Point Depot. Wow. <laughs> Eight, 9,000 people, two acoustic space and drums. Yeah. <laughs> well, it know? just goes to show you, though, what you're saying, though, about, you know, following your heart and, and your own artistic ideas, because you're the creative center of this. The reason people show up to Aslan gigs and the reason people buy Aslan records are because of Aslan. So a record label as an interlocutor to say, well, you're good or you're not, or you're this or you're that, it's all just nonsense. So, you know, you guys following your heart and doing what you wanted is, is really great because there's lots of artists who don't do that. They get chewed up in the machine. Yeah. Yes, you know. they do. They, they, get, they get confused. You know, they get they get sidetracked. They get told what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing, and this, that, and the other. You know, whether call it luck. Now, it, there is a lot of luck involved. Oh yeah, you no, know, oh, there yeah, there's a time there is, for everybody. Yeah, hundred yeah, yeah, percent. There is a lot of luck involved, but you know, I mean, so far, and Christy has said this, and we've all kind of this is our mantra: if people stop coming to see us, well, then that's the time for us to knock it on the head. Sure. But if this, if people keep coming, which they are, you know, yeah. which, which, which they still do. So why would we stop it? When you have yeah. that following there and you have people that enjoy the gigs and they love the gigs and you're giving them some enjoyment, you're yeah. giving them something because the Irish people aren't fools. To go to a gig now, it costs so much money. You get babysitters. You've got the price of the ticket. You have to get a taxi in. If you're traveling up from for the, for the Ivy Gardens, you probably get a hotel as well. Yeah. Irish people aren't stupid. If they go and see a band and the band are crap, they won't spend that money again. They say, "I've seen them. I've seen them. I didn't enjoy it." Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But what tends to happen with us is, and it happens to the likes of a Damien Dempsey gig as well. Don't get me wrong. We're not yeah. the only band doing this. Sure. In fact, all the Coronas, the mm. scripts, Code Lion. Yeah. People enjoy them. They enjoy yeah. the gigs. That's what brings them back. Yeah. And that's what enables the band to sustain itself without any other financial assistance from a record company or a management company. Or yeah. A that's an amazing position to be in. And I think, I think, I don't know how you feel about this, Billy, but I feel that Irish people feel a very strong connection to Aslan. Like Aslan fans feel, like I feel a strong connection to Aslan. Now, you and I have never met before, but yeah. um, as I was saying to you, discovering Feel No Shame, seeing Christy play, uh, and now having, I'm working on your new single, the video for your new yeah. single. It's almost like my... It's almost like completing a circle for me. This like, is, yeah. like the new video, which is going to look great. It's halfway finished. I can't wait to see it. I it looks, it looks really good. I'm excited about it. You see, that's the thing, David. Like, I'm as excited about 
release and hold on and the yeah. video that you're going to do for it. I'm as excited about that as I was when I was excited when This Is was released. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's like, you know, I'm dying for people to hear Christy's voice. I'm dying for them to hear the song. Yeah. The sentiment of it. It's just, ah. So yeah. it's, it's, that hasn't waned. Do you know what I mean? And it seems like whenever I look online and I see it out tour and you be in England and there might be a lovely shot of you sitting down, it seems like there's a really, from way the way I look at it, it seems like you have moved through all the bullshit and here you are now, elder statements of rock and roll. But you seem, <laughs> but you seem to be enjoying being together and it seems, you know, it always looks like this, this is the band here. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And there's a really good vibe. Like There is. Yeah. You see... <laughs> because we have that is because we know what it's like when we didn't have the band yeah. those five years we didn't have the band and yeah. then, now now it's like we really really appreciate it and for all the young bands out there you really really need to appreciate it because when it's taken away which it was from us for five years mm. you know when it's taken away you, you just but but I, I think now at this precise moment the band are sounding better than ever. Mm. I think we're performing better than ever. Obviously, Chrissy's not going to run around the stage. He's, he's, yeah. you know, he has cancer. We think yeah. about it. When you sure. actually think about that, that alone, just think yeah. about your singer having cancer. We shouldn't yeah. even be doing this at the yeah. level that we're doing that. So we are so, so lucky. And, you know, Christy says he's going to remember every gig now. He takes it, takes a breath and just, and take take it all in because mm. there was a time when none of us were 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 taking it all in. Yeah, we were we were losing the plot, you know. We were talking about that he and I about being grateful and and for where you're at and and I that's something I had to learn as well because being we were signed three times. I was signed three times. Yeah, band, but yeah, band were signed twice. I was signed three times, and I I kept getting myself in these positions, and then I would blow it all up. And I'd have to start from scratch. And we built a following here, and then we built a following in America as well, in the southeast kind of. No, it wasn't a large following, but you know, we yeah. still a room. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And uh, we were ticking over, and I never appreciated it. I was pretty unhappy at the time. I didn't. I just I couldn't. But now, when I work on things, I get the most out of them just in the moment of doing it. Do you know what I mean? Just in yeah. the moment of, of doing that thing, whether it be chat with you or filming something or writing something like just being in the moment of it, it that seems to be the thing. I, but it's terrible. You have to get an older, older head to realize that. Well, don't you really? <laughs> it's like, like we're, we're 37 years gone. 1982. Wow. Is that, is that 37 or 38 years? Is it 38 years? 1982, so Ew. it's it's uh, so that's yeah eight nine yeah twenty year twenty yeah thirty eight years thirty eight years. You think of like the average band, the lifespan of the average band would be three or four years, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. they go five, maybe they might be lucky five years. So I've been doing something with a bunch of blokes that I love for thirty eight years. I haven't worked a day in my life, David. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, no, seriously, seriously. I, know. I, would, I would do this for nothing. I would do. Mm. I just. I. I love the buzz of being in a band. I'm not mm. the greatest musician in the world. There's better musicians out there than me by far. Do you know what I mean? Sure. But I. I fit into the band. I'm part of that jigsaw, and and we all do. We're very lucky. Rod, Alan, the drummer, Joe, Christy. We all have our individual jobs to do, and we do them to the best of our ability. You know, like Joe would look after all the recording end and, and the, you know, the registering the songs and royalties. I would tend to look after the PR and, you know, that, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Alan, Alan does the accounts and deals with the, with the accountants. Rod would do a lot of social media, you know, so it's, right. it's, and Christy sings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the boys used to slag me after the gigs of the out chat with the girls, you know, and they'd be like, this fucker's not lifting gear, you know what I mean? Think no, no, no Chris, he's the singer. And, and believe you me, we're well, happy enough that he's the singer because yeah. Christy has a fault. He cannot say no. Mm. He can't, no matter what he's asked to do, he just can't say, Christy, um, listen, a uh, friend of mine passed away. Will you, will you sing in the church? Um, and we'll be saying, Christy, we're going to the UK in the morning. You can't be in the church. You can't. Christy will go, 
yeah. And he yeah. commits to things and he doesn't, he might know where he is the next day or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. he, it's just his kind heart. He just yeah. has this, he can't say no. Mm. So we just leave Christy to the singing. We don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> no. God knows, God knows where we be. If we give Christy a job. Yeah. But almost that sort of part of being a front man in a band as well is sort of, there's a bit of, I don't want to say flightiness because that's not the right word, but there has to be a little bit of, insanity is the wrong word too, but you know, yeah. there's yeah. this, thing to it do you know what yeah. I mean and I've it's, known it's not madness breaks. neither it's not madness there's a word for it all right yeah it, 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 it's like an eccentric but not eccentric yeah do you know what I mean and I think yeah. all singers have like as you said Christy is rock and roll to me yes you know what I mean without a doubt you know that's you know what he used to say know? to me when I was a kid he said was it jazz and blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll and rock and roll had a baby and he called it Christy Dignam <laughs> That's really I don't know if you remember that one. Well, you know, a couple of years after meeting Christy, I met Sinead O'Connor. She started going into Frank's oh, for lessons. What a singer. Well, she went to Frank's for lessons, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sorry to cut across you there, but right. Sinead O'Connor is the best, and I mean the best, female vocalist that Ireland has ever produced. Uh, 100%. There's no question like about that. Dolores O'Riordan and all the rest of them are... Yeah. are pale into comparison and, and she's made. still amazing Absolutely. I've seen a video of her at yeah. the Shane McGowan thing yeah. and it was just ridiculously yeah. good and I actually remember talking to her about Christy because she'd never seen Christy at that point and saying mm. that Christy was just amazing so I met Christy when I was 15 and I met her when I was 17 and I knew her for a very brief period of time but she was a massive influence on me yeah. because like Christy when she sang it was like this m- just amazing oh, magical experience amazing you know absolutely what I mean? amazing and she still has it do you know what she I mean she still has it the funny story about Sinead was we had this record company uh, they had the water boys they were called Ensign E-N-S-O-G-N. yeah Ensign yeah, yeah I Ensign. remember them. Yeah, yeah. and they were over to look at us they came to look at us we were in Litton Lane and we were set up and they came in Nigel and Chris from Enzyme. They were the two lads who owned the two the company. It. Yeah, they yeah. just, it was a two man yeah. company. They had huge success with the Water Boys. This is the C, that album, that yeah. album. And they were over here to sign some, uh, an Irish act. And they walked into the rehearsal room and we did our audition for them, you know, six or seven songs played for them. And they had this girl with her. And the girl that was with her was Sinead O'Connor. No way. Yeah. No, they, they didn't sign us. And the reason we didn't sign them was, that, and, and it's, it's a mad one, they wanted, rather than re-record, if they signed us, they offered us a deal, but they wanted to use the demos as the right. album. Okay. And we were going, ah, hang on, these are penny pinching, do you know what I mean? That, that, yeah. You know, uh, it, we want to record, we want to get a proper producer proper, in, yeah. you, know, yeah. we, you know, we want to do this right. So yeah. we rejected their deal, but they signed Sinead O'Connor. Wow. And her debut album came out, Mandinka, on, on Enzyme Records. Yeah, that's yeah. a great album. I do not yeah. want what I haven't got. That's what it's called, yeah. right? Yeah, that's yeah. an amazing record. But she she was she's an amazing artist. I mean, I think Ireland, for such a small country, has produced such brilliant artists. You know, well, I mean... Well, David, we were doing uh, uh, Waiting for This Madness to End, and we had this song called Open Arms, you have to listen to it, right? Okay. When, we, when this interview finishes, have a listen to it. It's, it's on the Madness album. Okay. It's uh, it's it's uh, Sinead and Christy. Oh, and, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know yeah. that. Yeah. And we yeah. brought her in, and uh, there was a guy called Ian Grimble who produced the Manic Street Preachers, and, and that's he was producing the, the Madness album. And Sinead came in, and she just went into the... She went in, and she did what we asked her to do, you know, which she did. And then she said, can I just have a go and do my own thing with the song? And we were in the, listening at the desk and Ian Grimble was going, he was going, holy shit, she's amazing. Yeah. You know, here was this producer, you know, uh, he was just, he'd never heard her singing live before. Yeah. She has something really special. And she's back again. I'm really hoping yeah. she makes another record. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't I. talked to her in, in, in decades, literally yeah. in decades. Uh, but I want to try and get her on the podcast.
sometimes I think, and I don't know if you ever felt like this, like this is the most important thing. If this doesn't happen, then this doesn't happen. But it's not. <laughs> you know what I mean? That happens to us every week. <laughs> you know? But it's not, every though, week, is it? Because no, you just move not. on to the next thing, you, and the next thing, and yes. then yeah, you're and richer for it. The thing about it is, David, you can have a plan, right? And you can have a plan that you're going to go down that road, right? Yeah. And something will happen. Something will happen while you're on that road that will take you down a completely different path. Absolutely. You know, so that's the great thing about this business because every day is different. Every yeah. day. People say to us, you know, do you not get sick and tired of, of playing Crazy World and this is, and, you know, doing the set, you're doing the set for toward the odd years. And every audience is different, Dave. Every yeah. gig is different. Do I not every- get, do I get sick of hundreds of people coming and singing my songs back to yeah. me? Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a real drag, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? like, it's a pain. Yeah, it's yeah. terrible. Do you get no. sick of getting up and going to the office every day or, you know, doing whatever else you have to do? Look, I have to do mundane things to make a living. There's, there's of course a lot. you do. Yeah. Majority of things that I do now are creative and I really love and I'm really investing in my job. They're not music anymore. It's more film and sort of uh, writing and different things like that, write copy. And, and, but most people are not that fortunate. Most people don't get mm. to live their dream. Like I'm currently living my dream every day. Now, at one point it was to be a singer in a band, but I didn't know that I was just destined to be doing what I'm doing now is directing and, you know, writing yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, for young artists who are watching this, if they take anything from it, it is, you know, look at where you start, look at where you end up. And who knows what that, that, that road's going to bring. It's going to be, it's going to be even more amazing than you think it could be, but it might not be, think, might not be what you want it to be or think it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, with, me, with music, you'll know after the first kind of six or seven months, whether it's for you. Yeah. You know, you can just dip your toe in it. With me, I, 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 D- David, I saw Aslan in the Revenue Commissioners Club and I couldn't play an instrument. I couldn't do anything. But I said to myself, I want to be in that band. Yeah. And I went up to Tony and I said, Tony, can I join the band? And he went, but you can't play that. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I said, well, okay. I don't know if you've heard this story. It's, it's, a, well-known, it's a well-known story. So I used to work as a baker in, in, uh, in Finglas and in Gatos and, and uh, Downs is in Finglas. And the band used to rehearse in Alan Downey's garage, mm. which is in Finglas as well. I do know that, yeah. So six to two, Two o'clock, I'd be finished. I'd finish work and around to Alan's garage and sit outside the garage. Right? This was after seeing them in the Revenue Commissioners Club. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd finish, sometimes I'd bring a few cakes with me, a few donuts or whatever. The lads would open up the garage door. There'd be me standing. Ah, here he is. Yeah. With the cakes. Come on in for a cup of tea. <laughs> in for a cup of tea, blah, blah, blah. 1984, the band were doing... Uh, a Lark in the Park which is a gig 2FM used to do mm-hmm. A Lark in the Park in St. Anne's Park in Rohini and they said we want to fill out the sound a bit so we'll get three back and vocalists right so it was myself Ruth Hopper and a guy called Mark Spencer and the three of us got up and it was doing all the U's and the ah's and mm. Yeah, 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 all that, yeah. whatever it was. The yeah. three of us. That was my first time on stage with Aslan, 1984, wow. in the Lagna Park. Now, I kept the other two back and vocalists kind of went their separate ways, but I, right. kept, I kept arriving up at the, at the, at the garage. Right, I, with the cakes. With the cakes. Oh, very important. The cakes are a very important part of it. Absolutely, great and, and one day, a check came in. The lads were out to doing a Dave Fanning session, 2FM. This is way, way before we were signed, or, and, mm. and way before I feel no shame. And the lads said, we'll go to the boot in and we'll drink the check, as you did in those days. Of course. You, you wouldn't put the money into the band, no, we'll drink it. So mm. up we went, and I went with them. And the lads had a few drinks on them and I said, ask them again, can I be in the band? And they said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. Amazing. Because <laughs> the next day, instead of arriving at two o'clock, I arrived when they were arriving, 10 wow. o'clock in the morning. And they were going, what are you doing here? He told me I could be in the band. Amazing. And that was it, Dave. And I remember... We, uh, 
what they do, right? We'll do the use and the back and vocals and all the rest. And then there was a song called Fire in My Heart. And there was a bass synth line on it. Again, I couldn't play anything. So yeah. what I did was the riff, let's say the riff was do 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 let's say it was that. Yeah. I'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, write the numbers on the keyboard. And play it like that. And, yeah. and played the riff on fire of my heart. So I was in, and then Joe says, "Like, can you play? Aunt? Can you? Do you know any chords?" I said, ah, "Not too, not too, you know, not too well." Yeah. Then I got onto acoustic guitar, just maybe for one or two songs. It was percussion I played at the start, percussion and the bass synth. Wow. I used to hit all these effects. I had this drum. It was like a syndrome. Boo, boo. <laughs> but you wanted it bad enough to be exactly. in the band. Exactly. That's the po- the point. The whole point I'm trying to make is. If you follow your dream, even like I followed my dream, do you know what yeah. I mean? Even yeah. though it was nay on impossible, I couldn't. You can't join a band unless you can play something. Mm. Bollocks, of course you can. Of course you can. Yeah. You know, if you want, it, if you but, want it that bad, David, if you want something that bad. And that's what led to me to going into, into singing lessons with Frank. Yeah. Because I didn't want to be a, a brilliant, it wasn't going to improve my voice and make me a brilliant singer. Mm. The reason I went to Frank was, as were gigging three or four nights a week, I was doing back and vocals and I was straining my voice. Yes. So what yeah. I wanted to learn was how to do five, six gigs a week. Yeah. Without being hoarse. That, that, Having the thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I got out of the singing lessons. Sure, I, I remember that, you know? when I, I moved I moved into Frank's house in 1990. We had been living in America, came back, knew I wanted to be a singer. Uh, and I would I was going to the group lessons, you know, and doing my best Christy Dignam impression in every one, you know. Oh, <laughs> holding myself <laughs> like him and all. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I sang out of tune terribly. Right. Constantly, because I'd never sang. I just, yeah. and uh, I, I, I have to say, I was definitely a bit of a joke, and I, I guess I understand why, to a certain extent, that that I was to people. And then when I was twenty-two, I got signed by Sony, and when I got signed, uh, it was everywhere here. It was yeah. in the newspapers, and you know, we did our, our in the factory. We recorded in the big room. That's where we did our album and all that. Right. Crap. Kevin Shirley came over. I didn't. I didn't go out to clubs and bars on the weekend. I wrote songs. I had a girlfriend and all that, but I wrote songs. I rehearsed. We rehearsed five days a week. I wanted it so bad. I went to yeah. every singing lesson I could. I wanted yeah. it so bad. Yeah. And I outdistanced all the other people that were laughing at me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, I never ended up where I needed to because I was such a crazy bastard, but the, it, it is what you're saying. If you want it bad yeah. enough, yeah. then you do what it takes to make that happen. We rehearsed in a pigsty. We, 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 we got an upgrade from Alan's garage to a pigsty. Think about that. Yeah. And we, had, we used to have to go up to the back of the airport. And the pigsty was basically a concrete building with a tin roof on it. It was freezing cold. Yeah, and we'd be, up like there, we'd be up there in December, huddled around the Super Sarah. Alan would be on the drums with his overcoat on. Yeah. And, and uh, because we couldn't afford to to rehearse in town. Mm. We went up to that pigsty for two years. Feel no shame. This is, we're all written in that pigsty. Yeah. It was like, you know, we really wanted it. Yeah. You know, we really, really wanted it. That and when you want know. that, this is where the term starving artist comes from. And these are the shoplift crackers from grocery store, uh, uh, garages in America when we were playing on tour over there because there's no money. But I remember us being so broke and they being entered into a battle of a bands competition, right? Which is a disaster. But yeah. we were entered into it and it was almost like we had to win this in order to eat for the rest of the week, right? Yeah. And we and we were by far the better band. Some little band whose dads had paid some money to the college anyway, they they gave him but the sorority that had run it gave us a gig for money. Right. For six hundred quid, I remember. Right. But like you, you have to want it because it's not comfortable. It's not. You no. know what I mean? It's not. You're not, it, you know, people have this impression. You have to want it, but I think, and, and this applies to anything. If you want it bad enough, I always say to my kids, you want to do something bad enough, you just have to do the work. That's it. And you have to want it more than the other person does as yeah, well. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that stood us. You know, in, in a sense, when I look back on it, the fact that we were out out of Dublin. We were up at the airport in the pigsty. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we weren't. We weren't part of that 
click, the Dublin yeah. click. Yeah. You know, we, we we honed our own sound. We weren't being influenced by what was what was trendy in Dublin at the time. You know, we had our own sound, which was which was which was great. So it, there was advantages to the pigsty. You know? Yeah, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. So the question is, what's next for Asla? <laughs> Where do well, you go get, from here, this, Billy? Get this lockdown out of the way, obviously, and then I mean, it's going to be a different place, David. I think. Um, I, 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 I can't see like we're due to, we're due to play the Ivy Gardens on the 3rd of July That I don't think that gig is going to go ahead I don't think they're going to let mass crowds I think it'll it'll be a, a slower opening up yeah you know um, so but we're ready like yeah. we'll, we'll be ready like I pick the guitar up every day and, and just just keep the fingers keep the yeah, tops yeah. of the fingers hard. <laughs> keep them hard you know, yeah. keep them hard and, I go, and uh, you know Christy's itching to get out I was did a, uh, I was talking to Christy yesterday and you know we're all we're here you know mm-hmm. we're, we're ready to go but I think it's going to be a while yet Dave. I yeah. think it is and I think that uh, like you see China has opened back up and when China opened back up uh, you know, like 80% of the restaurants are doing takeaway because people are afraid to mass gather, you know? Yeah. So I had a really good idea for Aslan. I emailed Denise about it there a couple of weeks ago. So maybe we'll do that when things open back up and we're able, able to, to able to get to together, but we won't be able to have a mate. You know what I mean? Something, yeah. something, something yeah. I thought might be a really cool thing. But listen, I think that is a fantastic place to leave it. And I really appreciate uh, the time. I can't wait to meet you in person, Billy. I know. First time meeting. Yeah. First time meeting, and we've so many connections. Yeah, you know, Frank being the obvious one, and then Christy being the other one. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But, but I'll tell no, you thank you for doing that because in Aslan again, man, I really yeah. am. I cannot. Yeah. Wait. I mean, I'd I'd love to invite you down to the Ivy Gardens. What a gig! What a buzz! Well, what the a next buzz. time, Billy, I'll hold the you next that one. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, as Christy says, it's not it's not the fact that it's the biggest gig out of the crowd. Mm. Some some of the best Aslan gigs have been to fifty people in a pub. I believe and, that, and, and so do I, and they. No, because I've been there and they have been. Yeah, they have been, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. But uh, David, thanks. You stay safe and stay sane. Look after yourself. Do me best. All right. Look after yourself, buddy. God bless. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.